I'm Micah. I'm part of the digital team at Ocean X. We are on a mission to explore the ocean and bring it back to the world. Right now, our research vessel, the Ocean Explorer, is in the Red Sea on the Red Sea Decade Expedition, which we're conducting in partnership with the National Center for Wildlife. And today we are so excited to connect you with one of the scientists who is on that expedition right now. She's on the boat, Jen Thompson. Jen is a scientist with experience tagging and spotting animals so scientists can study them. She has tracked elephants in Namibia and surveyed humpback whales in Mozambique. And right now she's looking for all kinds of ocean animals in the Red Sea. So today she's gonna to be giving us a look at exactly how she does all of this. So without further ado, we're gonna kick it over to Jen who is coming to us from onboard Ocean Explorer. Hi Jen, welcome. Thank you so much, Micah. So yeah, um, hi everyone. My name is Jen, um, as Micah said. So currently, yeah, I'm on the Ocean Explorer and today I'm super excited to tell you all about the different types of megafauna surveys that we are doing on Ocean X. And yeah, this is me. Um, so as you can see, the first slide is a picture of me about to go in a helicopter for the first time. Um, and I was super excited and it was a brilliant day all around. So a bit about me. So I am not a megafauna researcher per se. I wear many different hats. So I first came to Saudi Arabia only three months ago. So I work at a university called KAUST as a field research technician. And I was super lucky um, to be in the right place at the right time. And I've got the opportunity to be almost four months on and off the ocean explorer, um, participating in many different scenarios. So I am doing scuba diving. I help with logistics. I help with deep sea biology um, and helping in the labs as well. But most, um, most fun for me, uh, I get to spend two phases working with the megafauna team. Um, and I got this because I've actually had some experiences um, all over the world with megafauna and indeed tagging some animals. So this actually was me a few years ago. So these images show myself in the um, desert in South Africa, a place called the succulent Karoo. And here I was tagging populations of elephant shrews and rats and small mice. And this was to see their population structure and how they behave. So that involved me putting tiny little GPS tags on these animals and then going out during the day with what looks like a huge antenna, a radio tracker. So I can see where they go at night and during the day. I then moved on to doing the same thing, but with elephants. Um, and also putting out uh, camera traps to see um, populations of leopards and painted wolves. Then I realized that I wanted to be a marine biologist. So it just shows that you are never too late to change your course. So I began um, in Mozambique when I was learning to dive. I started studying the whales there and seeing their behaviors and population numbers. And then that finally led me to the Maldives, where I participated in cetacean um, cruises, where I looked at the populations of different types of dolphins and whales, and even animals like turtles and sharks. So in terms of what I'm doing here in the Ocean X expedition, so the whole expedition is called the Red Sea Decade Expedition. And we're basically looking at characterizing all the different types of megafauna in all different areas of the sea. Now, I should maybe say what a megafauna actually is. So a megafauna is just another way of saying a really big animal, which is, which is an animal which you can kind of characterize according to area. So you may think of pandas in China or whales in the sea, just a really big animal. 
Sometimes they may say that a megafauna is over a thousand kilograms, but it is quite a broad definition. Now here on OceanX, we want to see the biodiversity of megafauna. So all the different types that we have in all the shallows, right the way to the deep sea. So to do this, um, because this has never really been done before, um, the latest survey was done almost 35 years ago, and that was primarily looking at a species called dugongs. And this was looking at megafauna in shallow waters. Now, in the um, Red Sea Decade Expedition, we want to see what animals are there in really shallow waters and really deep waters. So we split um, them into phases, and we call these phases phase one and phase two. And we use different techniques for different phases. So in phase one, we mainly um, look at bridge observations. So if you see on the screen, I've put a circle where the bridge is, so we're right up high trying to see megafauna. And then for the rest of the time, we use the cool helicopter as well. So on bridge surveys, what we need to do is have a look at the megafauna at a particular spot. And we use some bits of equipment to do this. Now, one thing which is really helpful is that we use a range finder. Um, and what this is, is um, a transparent bit of Perspex and we hold it up to the horizon and by doing this, we can see the distance the animal is. So on the rangefinder, um, the topmost line is the line of the horizon, and there is a little hole in the center, and what you do is you put your eye to it, and that's, that means it is on the horizon, and all the lines below that are the distance um, from the ship to that animal. Now this is quite a clever bit of kit, as it is calculated to the height of the bridge itself, which is 18 meters above um, the sea level. We also use binoculars and cameras in case we see something. And also we have the Ocean X sea log system, so we can record their waypoints. However, what we mainly need is our eyes and a lot of luck, because it is really hard to spot megafauna when the ship is staying in one place. So we do have a lot of waiting and occasionally we do see a lot of birds and not a lot of whales. But this is still really important because what we do is we log the effort. And now the effort is the amount of hours that we spend looking for megafauna. And this is really important as it tells us the abundance of the animals out there. So if I say to you, we saw three whales today, you might think that is really good. But what if I tell you that we saw three whales in three weeks or three hours? So you can see how logging the number of hours we spend looking for megafauna can tell us about the abundance, so the amount of animals that we actually can see. And then in terms of helicopter surveys, so we can do this in phase two, so all the time in the shallow phases and then occasionally during the deep phases, so in phase one. And again, what we have here are binoculars and a camera, but most importantly, we do use our eyes because sometimes using binoculars is quite hard when the helicopter is moving quite fast. Now we also have these poles, which you can see in the middle picture here. And this is also really important because it makes our method of searching for megafauna accurate. Now, if I say to you, um, how good is your eyesight? Some people can see really far and some people like me cannot see very far at all. Now, what this pole does is give both megafauna spotters a reference point. So we can't look further than this pole. And when the helicopter is up high, this pole, like the rangefinder, can show us the distance in which we survey. So this means that everything is accurate and both of us, both researchers, are looking in the same area. So everything is accurate. Um, another thing that we need for helicopter surveys is a microphone because it can get super noisy in there. And of course, we need to tell people when we see something. Um, and with megafauna, so as we said before, we can use the megafauna, the helicopter for megafauna surveys in deep areas and shallow areas. So we use a different flight path each time. So for deep areas, the boat is in one place 
And so what we're looking for is megafauna in one particular area. So like a point on a map. So what we do is we make the helicopter go in an expanding square shape. So using the boat as a center and going round and round and round, making the distance that the helicopter goes out by the same each time. Then when we use the helicopter in shallow habitats, we have the shore as our reference point. So then we use line transects. So we make the helicopter go from the boat to the shore, um, there and back again, again moving across each time. So that is how we survey areas um, very methodically. And so we don't miss out any spaces. So we hopefully can see as many megafauna as we can. And these are a few photos from the helicopter surveys that we've done so far. As you can see, we are leaning out of the windows and trying to see as many megafauna as we can. And um, when we finish and go back to the boat, um, the pictures on the right, you can see how the helicopter, the helipad is on the boat itself. So when the boat is in choppy waters, it can make for a bumpy landing as well. So this is all well and good, but what happens if we actually see something? So we, at all points, need to make sure that we keep eyes on it. So that is what we're doing here. We're making sure that we can see the megafauna at all times by pointing to it because the helicopter goes quite fast. And so we don't want to miss it. After that, we take as many notes as quickly as possible. The most important thing to do is get either the helicopter pilot or ourselves in sea log to record the waypoint. So the precise location where the megafauna is. We can then try and see if we know its identity. So what is the type of megafauna? If we don't know, we write down anything we can that can make it distinguishable to us. Anything which is unique about it. And of course, we can take photos as well. Another thing that we do is record its behavior. So is the animal diving? Is it in groups? Is it by itself? Is it moving fast or slow? So the most important thing to do is take as many notes as we can as quickly as possible because sometimes the whale or dolphin can dive deep down and we won't see it again. So sometimes, like I said, we may know the identity, but sometimes it's really hard to figure out on the move. So we need a bit of help. And this is where we can use something called dichotomous keys or just identity charts. And this, um, we can see the type of megafauna we have by answering simple yes, no questions. So it's really easy for us to get down to precisely what it is. So for example, we can see how big it is. Does it have a fin? Does it have a blowhole on its head? What is the markings on it? So all these things can tell us the type of megafauna that we see. So now onto the good bit. What have we actually seen so far? So we've been really lucky on our very first helicopter cruise. The very first sighting was a mother and calf dugong pair. Now, dugongs are a type of marine mammal, which means that they came actually from the land into the sea all those years ago. So this actually means that dugongs are more related to elephants than they are to animals like whales. We also see animals, for example, that, that are called whale sharks. Now, a whale shark, contrary to the name, is actually a huge fish. And these fish, we can tell the individual by looking at its back. So each whale shark has a unique pattern of spots, a bit like a constellation. So we can see who's who by taking a photo of these spots and then running it through a database to see precisely who we have. And also, we've seen many types of dolphins as well. So as you may know, dolphins are really super intelligent. They can even play together and play games and they have families and friends. Now, dolphins are also really cool in the fact that they have a type of sonar in their head and they can hunt for fish by sending out sounds. And if it comes back to them, they can see exactly where fish are and they can get a meal that way. And this is called echolocation. And of course, we've also seen some whales, some manta rays, and even some cool sea turtles as well. 
Uh, one fun fact about sea turtles is that they can hold their breath when resting for over four hours, even up to around seven hours. And during this time, they can lower their heart rate to be super, super slow. So we've seen many cool things so far, and we hope to see many things in the future as well. So why does this all matter? Why are we looking at these big animals? So megafauna are really important, not only as symbols of our planet and we should protect them, but they do play an important part in all of life, so in our ecosystem together. Megafauna can control um, the populations of smaller animals. So if they eat animals below, they can control the number of animals which are there and keeps everything in a nice balance. They are also important because they can shape the, their environment. So, for example, elephants in the savannas, they may knock down trees, but that's really important for getting light onto the surface. And whales can feed and move vast distances, so can move nutrients around, so can help keep the oceans super healthy by having these whales here. It's something called um, the whale pump. So what happens is um, when they feed, they just take in all the nutrients in the water. And when they go back up to the surface to feed, um, when they defecate or where they release waste, um, they can release those nutrients as well. So um, they basically transport nutrients from the bottoms to the top and vice versa, and also move it around. So a bit like uh, elephants in the savannah, when they eat things and when they release waste, they move things around. Whales just do the same thing, but just up and down as well as from side to side. And of course, the data from the Red Sea Decade Expedition is really important because we know, number one, how many animals are left, and number two, where they are. So by knowing how many there are, if we can see that their numbers are really low, we know that we need to conserve them and help protect them. By knowing where these animals are, then we can start to maybe tag and track them to see exactly where they're going. So then we can protect those precise areas in which they go and which areas are important to them. For example, do we need to um, have ships moving around for certain whales? And the image that you see here in the middle is indeed of a turtle which is being tagged. Now this tag is a satellite tag and a satellite going overhead around the poles and sends a signal to it so we know precisely where this is in all times. Uh, okay, so thank you so much for listening everyone. Um, I now just want to play a quick video of our first heli scouting mission. So this was five days into the entire expedition and was super exciting. So we will play this now and then we can take questions afterwards. Wow, sorry for my mute, everyone. Thank you, Jen. That was so cool. You know you have a dream job when it's spotting whale sharks from a helicopter. Um, it looks like we started out in the lab on Ocean Explorer and you are in a cool location. Yes, I'm so sorry. So while the video was playing i actually had to move just next door i mean the light is slightly better so that is good 
So at the moment, we're currently on a deep station, which means ship operations start um, super early. So I had to quickly move out of the way, but I think this is a better location. It gives us a chance to um, see a second part of the, of the boat, which is a really cool boat, as I understand. Um, We've got a lot of really good questions from some students at the Kaus School, and we also have a group from the Kaus School on the Zoom call with us. So hi, good morning to you guys. Um, if any of you have a question that you'd like to ask Jen, um, use the raise hand button on Zoom so we'll know to flip over to you guys. Um, the first question we have is from Mohammed Khan, and he has a good question about tagging. He's curious, how exactly do you tag the animals? Is it a dart or something else? Oh, that's that is a good question. So I suppose you can. It depends if you want to tag the animal to just know its identity or to gather information about it, so where it's going. So um, if you want to tag an animal just for its identity, you can just use um, kind of like he said, a dart, but also um, little metal clips which go in their ears, um, a bit like an earring. And that either has um, a number on it, so we know exactly who it is when we can um, tag it again. We can also maybe put um, identification tags by way of um, paint or different small dots of dye on the animal as well. In terms of if you want to see where the animal is going, that's when we can put different sensors and tags on the animal. So uh, if you want to use radio tracking for animals which are in a small area, you can put a tiny GPS on. Um, so I think I mentioned before that some of the animals I tagged in Africa, we almost had them wearing a GPS backpack, if you like. It was a tiny little um, GPS monitor with some um, little strings and we put them just as a backpack uh, on the animal. Um, and other tags we can actually glue with some sort of resin onto the animal itself. For example, this would be useful in turtles, where we can put satellite tags on that animal as well. Even some animals like whales, where we want to have more tags where we look at what the animal is doing for a short amount of time and it um, the tag releases itself. We can use almost a uh, suction cups as well to put on the animal. And then when it's collected all its data, um, that tag will re simply release pop up to the surface and we can collect it that way. This is a, um, a question that I have, but also from um, Coralia. She was curious if the tag affected the animal's behavior at all. Okay, so that's a really good question. Um, so tags which are on the animal itself on the surface, for example, um, ear tags or anything, they wouldn't typically affect it. Um, although it is really important that we make sure that nothing um, affects animals behavior or physical state. So typically, um, the tag has to be either three or 5% of the animal's body weight maximum. So it doesn't get it doesn't lose um, more energy when it's carrying the tag around. What we like to do as well is observe the animal for maybe a few hours or days after we put it on to see if it has any behavior changes. Um, so sometimes it, if we see an animal is behaving differently, we would take the tag off straight away. Okay, it looks like we have a hand raised over in our classroom. So if you guys just remember to unmute yourselves and then um, introduce yourself and Fire away with your question. Um, hi, uh, my name is Yusuf. I'm a, I'm a student at the Cal School. Uh, and last year I got the opportunity to do some research about corals. So I kind of, my question was wondering if the megafauna that we see have any relationship with the coral holobionts or even hard coral cover in the Red Sea. Ooh, that is a really good question. I, I am not entirely sure. So I think, for example, um, reefs are really important for um, more 
elasmobranchs, so the fish, so whale sharks and um, the reef sharks as well, just because by having the reef there, the reef um, can support all the different types of life and have homes for the small fish which the sharks eat. So I suppose that can play a role in it as well. Um, and I think as well, I don't know if this has actually been quantified, but um, I was talking before about how huge animals, for example, whales, they help move nutrients around. Um, so coral reefs actually are really good at thriving in more nutrient poor areas. So maybe at some point when the whales move nutrients around, it can affect the reefs itself. But as to the exact details, I'm not entirely too sure about how much megafauna affects coral reefs. So that's a really good question. Okay, uh, all right. oh, go ahead. Do you have a follow-up? No, uh, no, but there's a, another student asking a question. Okay, if you're ready, come on up, say hi. Uh, hello, uh, <laughs> my name's Bruno. And uh, recently uh, I attended another uh, KAUST seminar where a researcher called uh, Mr. Colin Williams found that um, wahoo, which is a fish species, occurs uh, sporadically in the Red Sea. And so my question was if there were any plans to, uh, as well as uh, ma marine mammals, to track um, um, pelagic uh, migratory fish species in the Red Sea. Ooh, um, so I'm not entirely sure on if researchers are going to do that in the Red Sea now. I, I really hope so. So I do know that migratory fish, especially um, animals such as tuna, have been tagged, for example, around the Americas. Um, so that would be really good for, um, for KAUST if researchers do start to do that. I know in terms of the tags that they would have to use, um, they can either use clippings on the fins or even, um, and this is where it can get quite invasive, they may have to put um, a sensor inside the fish itself um, by making a really tiny hole and then they would put the tag inside. And this would be to measure all aspects of the fish. So no matter where they go, but also how the environment changes and how the fish would respond to that. So they do this by way of what is called biologging. So they can see exactly um, where the fish is going and how it would change according to its environment. So how fast the fish would go, um, how much is it, it's eating and things like that. So hopefully in the future, they may start to tag uh, migratory fish in the Red Sea. Um, so yeah, I'm, I really look forward to that if that does occur. Okay, here's another good question for you, Jen. Um, Jemima is curious, could we import animals to the Red Sea? Ooh, okay. So I suppose in terms of um, relocating the same species, so the same type of animal that that would be, I suppose, feasible, especially if animals are endangered, for example, um, in some of my previous work, we had to relocate uh, turtles because they, um, because of the cold environments or because of the changes in sea temperature, they do get a bit shocked and disorientated. So that means when we're tagging them, they we find that they move in a really strange direction. So we may have to rescue them and bring them back. So maybe in terms of a population, um, replenishment scenario that could be good in terms of importing different species that would be bad because um what happens is if animals come in and they're not meant to live here they may force out other animals from that habitat so we may be starting to see this with the Suez Canal. So that canal creates a channel between uh, the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. So we may have some animals coming in which are not meant to be here. So we are accidentally importing them in. And this can be bad because they may um, throw some animals out of their original homes. The whole ecosystem gets out of balance um, okay, here's a couple of coral questions. Um, one is, can we revive bleached corals? 
Ooh, okay. So I am not a coral biologist, but I have worked with corals before. So corals basically look like um, an upside down jellyfish, if you like. They are called um, polyps and the hard um, skeleton is typically made out of calcium carbonate, but some, for example, soft corals um, have a different structure. Now, um, in terms of bleaching, uh, corals also have um, a partnership with algae inside them. And this algae is called zooxanthellae, which is a bit of a mouthful. Now, when the temperature of the water gets too high, these plants can um, be expelled from the coral. And this is actually what makes a coral white because the plants inside them gives the coral their color. Now, this just means that the coral is sick, if you like. And so we actually can revive bleached corals, but only if the temperature of the water comes down again really quickly. Um, and also if the environment is quite nice for the corals. If the environment is too stressed for too long, then we won't be able to revive them. And that's when the plants that go, they won't come back into the corals. So that's when the corals will actually die. So yeah, corals that are bleached are, let's say only sick and not yet dead. Okay, we've got a lot more questions um, piled up, but I just wanna shout out to our friends in the Zoom call with us. If you guys have other questions, do feel free to raise your hand. We love hearing from you. Um, okay, Lana Al has a question. If 1% of the reef is coral and 25% are living things, how is there enough room for all the fish? <laughs> oh, I love this. Okay, so I think what she's referring to is the statement about the importance of coral reefs. So coral reefs take up only about 1% of the seafloor, but they are home to about a quarter of all marine life. So this is where um, these numbers are coming from. So in terms of how is there enough room for all the fish? Uh, so what we like to talk about is the complexity of the reef and all the different, uh, I suppose, cracks and shape which the corals make. So if you think about it, um, a bit like a forest, the coral reefs have all these little places for all the fish to go and make their homes in. And also the reef can go not only um, from, you know, from left to right, but also we have the 3D aspect of the reef. And of course, loads of the fish are super, super tiny. Um, there's also all the animals that live on the corals themselves and also in the sediments around coral reefs too. So all this means that a lot of different types of animals can fit into a really small area of reef um, at that same time. Um, and as well, you have all the animals in the water column as well, um, just above that reef. So that is how coral reefs can support loads of different types of animals altogether. Wow, that was a really cool question and a really cool answer. Um, oh, we have a hand raised from our friends in the classroom again. So, hello, what's your question? Hi, um, I'm Susan Rhodes. I'm one of the ecology teachers here at the Cal School. Um, we teach environmental science. And I have questions about tagging and about the tracking that you were doing, or mainly about the tracking. So I wanted to know about when you're in the helicopter or on the bridge, how often do you do those? And do you repeat the data collection on a day-to-day -day basis in the same place or is it continually moving? Okay, fab, yeah. So in terms of our um, survey, it depends on how many research re researchers we have available. So on the bridge surveys, we like to have um, at least two people at a time to take um, kind of both sides of the ship at once. We do that typically for eight hours a day. So on a good day, we have 16 hours of effort. Now, we the location in which we survey is kind of dictated by the ship's path itself. So 
as you may have seen, we've had to move because of operations. So when the ship is stationary or when the ship is moving, we do not actually dictate that. So um, in terms of megafauna surveys for on the bridge, we create it as point samples. So only in just that particular place. Um, on the helicopter, we don't try and repeat measures because again, it is actually about fuel and how much area we can cover in, let's say one to two hour bursts at a time. So on helicopter surveys, we try and make it about the areas covered. And we, I know there is a bit of, um, we have to make the data as accurate as possible, but also we need to cover as big of an area as possible. So in the helicopter surveys, we try and make it different areas each time. But in those areas, we survey it as methodically as possible by making the transects all equidistant apart. Thank you very much. We have one more question from one of the students. Perfect. Um, so Earlier, you mentioned the, uh, the Suez Canal and species moving uh, through it. I was wondering if you could discuss the viability of putting, uh, of tracking invasive species like lionfish in the Eastern Mediterranean and, you know, invasive species altogether that pass through the Suez Canal. And what do you think that would be possible considering there would be smaller species? Ooh, okay. That is a very good question. Um, so, Oh, ooh. I think um, in terms of tagging really small fish, I'm not entirely sure um, what the technology is for that yet. So for example, small on small mammals, the tags have to be super tiny. Um, and then the range of those tags because of the data storage is quite limited. So we were working on a range of around 100 meters. And for bigger animals, we can actually use um, the bigger tags and they use the satellite systems above us. Um, and that creates a ping every time they move. And so we can do that on a magnitude of um, indeed oceans. But again, we have a problem with the satellites. So the satellite um, tagging system we use goes over um, the poles. So that means the closer to the Arctic or Antarctic, the more um, resolution we have in that data. And the closer we are to the equator or in places like the Red Sea, it can be a bit patchy. And again, so we can um, tag really large fish, but I'm not entirely sure of the tag size we have for small fish, especially given the fact that we have to make it at least um, 5% of their body size. And for the smaller fish, it's super, super small. I know that there are some um, advances in tag technology, especially um, creating almost um, sensors on a tiny chip, which they are looking at um, putting on small sea turtles. But on small fish, when they when we basically need to invasively maybe put a tag on, I'm not entirely sure, but that could be something which is up and coming for the future. Um, as far as I know right now, the lionfish um, problem or invasive species, they move super fast. And so that is a situation which we have to be almost um, reactive about. So deal with um, the invasive species when we see them. And I don't know how much of tagging technology is there for it to be proactive. So can we tag these fish um, when they are juveniles? That is a question for the future. So I am not entirely sure, but that was an amazing question because I have no idea. <laughs> it sounds like that's a good question for um, future scientists, maybe a good interesting research project to start working on. Um, I think it's also very interesting because the tag technology has come a long way, but still um, what we can do in the oceans is super hard because we have literally got this body of water where communications and things are really hard to um, find solutions for. That was one of our questions from the chat. Carly was curious about the challenges of studying ocean animals specifically uh, which how's that different from what you're doing when you're tracking animals or tagging animals on land? So, uh, yeah, I think definitely is the fact that 
Vega underwater and we are very limited um, in terms of actually seeing that. So we were very lucky in this phase to have um, drones so we can actually see them from the surface. But um, yeah, the challenges of um, yeah having animals that dive really far down is, is quite problematic. Um, for whales, we can have pop-up tags. So that is where we put um, data in a chip and we it's like a small suction cup and we can put that on the whale and when the whale dives deep down, we can get all the information and it comes back up. But then we have the problem, I think said be, I said before, of the storage of that data. So we can see how far um, down the whale goes, but that actually uses a lot of data because we can see um, where the whale goes in three dimensions. So that tag will only last for one to two days and then it will pop up and we don't know where the whale is again so yeah lots of challenges um so hopefully in the future we can find ways of allowing tags to stay on animals for a really long time um, without um affecting their behaviors and trying to get as much data as possible but i think these three things haven't um all come together yet it looks like i can't tell if you all in the classroom have your hand raised from the last time or if you have a new question but if you do have a new question, just give us a wave so we know to switch over to you all. Um, in the meantime, okay, Maven has a question, some sort of following to what we were talking about going down into the deep. Um, he's curious what's different between having robots go down, but not you. So if the robot goes down versus you going down into the deep. Okay, amazing. So I suppose on here we have um, ROVs and AUVs. And so ROVs stand for um, Robotic um, Underwater Vehicles. And um, the ROV on here can go down to around 6,000 meters. Um, so we take this um, usually for samples, um, not so much um, tagging megafauna, but we have actually spotted some um, deep sea sharks down there, which is super cool. Um, I suppose things like robots, submersibles are amazing for sampling and spotting because they can survive obviously down there for a lot longer than us and they can take all of our samples. But then what happens if we see something new and what happens if there is a new discovery? Then how will that robot know to pick up a sample or not. Um, so this is why, especially for an ROV, there is always somebody watching the monitors so we can program it to maybe stop and see something new. For example, yesterday we had a lot of squids and sharks on the monitor. So we knew then to make the ROV stop and so we can get a closer look at it. So I think there is an amazing opportunity for robots and technologies to explore the deep sea because they can physically stay longer down there. But there always needs to be, I think personally, some human on the other end, because then we can see, um, we can make those decisions about what is new and what we want to see as well. I think it's really cool that you get to be one of the humans on the other end of that. <laughs> and one of our questions, uh, this is from Lana Al and Ryan. It's a good question. Um, how do you become a marine biologist? And if you weren't a marine biologist, what would you be? I love this question. Um, okay, so how do you become a marine biologist? In more ways than one, I suppose. So I think when I was growing up, I thought you had to study marine biology at uni. And while this is really important, um, as I now know here, people can come on Ocean X or indeed study the sea via loads of different disciplines. So we have um, individuals who came from studying genetics or um, microbes. Um, so yeah, loads of different ways you can um, do it. I would definitely say that studying uh, biology and also maybe maths at uni is important because there is a lot of data. Um, how I became a marine biologist is the fact that I worked 
with animals in all different settings. So yeah, as I said before, on in deserts and also in jungles. And I basically acquired lots of transferable skills that I can then pass on to the marine environment as well. And that helps because people from lots of different disciplines can all come together. So I think not having a set path can be useful as well. In terms of um, diving or snorkeling or swimming experience, I would say definitely learn to scuba dive as it's amazing and it's very useful for surveying. Um, also, if you don't do that, that is equally fine because I know um, friends and colleagues who work purely on vessels and in rock pools, for example. If I wasn't a marine biologist, very easy. I would try and be an astronaut, which I know sometimes can seem a bit far off, but that is a dream. But if I wasn't a scientist at all, I think I would do something completely different. I would um, be an author and an illustrator and open a little bookshop. So very, very different, um, which is actually interesting because I love um, all types of arts um, as well. And I think they can play a really good role in science communication, just like what we're doing now. So I think no matter what you're interested in, you can make it work. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point too. Um, if you're finding all these cool discoveries, it's good to be able to share them with people and, and talk about them so the general public understands. Um, it looks like we have and this can be our last question for the day, but it looks like um, we have a question from our classroom. Hi there, um, my name's Emma, I'm the biology teacher here. Um, KAUS has a big focus on artificial intelligence and I just wondered whether you use AI for um, determining where you should be looking. So whether that's helping you in the tracking, so not the identification so much as like where you should be in the Red Sea. Um, so I suppose if you mean where we're going to stop for uh, point observations on the bridge, that is determined actually by um, the mapping team on Ocean X. So, so they look at the bathymetry and what is below and where the ship actually stops. Um, we do that just to look at samples for the ROV and submersibles. And then we use that spot to determine um, the site for bridge observations. In terms of artificial intelligence for tracking in the helicopter, at the moment, because we don't know what is out there and what um, we need to cover all of the Red Sea at once, we're mainly doing it um, methodically. So where the boat goes, then we choose our site based off that. So mostly doing it as um, an ad hoc um, experience. So when, when the ship stops, then we look at where we are and then we choose our site then. Then we have about 24 hours to develop a flight plan and then go from there. So in terms of using AI to spot where things are for the surveys, not so much. Um, but I know, for example, uh, they're developing different technologies to maybe once we do find out where animals are, we can see um, if we can pull up signatures of animals on echo sounders. So we know, OK, this signal tells us that a whale is nearby and then we can maybe move the ship or go somewhere else to avoid it if that answers your question. <laughs> that was a cool question. All of these were really good questions. And um, thank you so much, Jen. I think we're gonna start wrapping up now, but thank you so much for giving us that look into, like I said, the coolest job. Um, thanks everyone for joining us, but I wanna give an extra special shout out to the students and teachers tuning in from the Kaust School and for bringing such awesome questions. Everybody in the chat, thank you guys for your questions as well. We're going to be hosting some more of these live talks with scientists on board the Ocean Explorer as the expedition continues. So you can follow along with us and find out all those details on our social channels where we are at Ocean X. Thank you all again so much, and we will see you next time.